Good morning. Tomorrow, I have jury duty. Uh, I'll find out today whether I really have jury duty. And even if I have to go in, I'll find out tomorrow whether they'll keep me. Uh, I doubt they'll keep me, but uh, after I've testified 100 times in court, most, most people don't want me on a jury. So anyway, um, anybody have any questions? We were talking about externalities before. Um, anyway, we'll let you know what the schedule is um, uh, as we find out what the schedule is. Uh, we talked about, let's see, the last externality we talked about is if you build it, they will come. There's this regulation people, states are saying you must have 15 or 20 percent of your uh, utility energy as renewable energy by 2025 or whatever. So uh, there's all kinds of solar credits now. Uh, there's people are building uh, wind turbines. Uh, the biggest one I've seen, there are probably bigger ones, is in Indiana. I'm driving through northern Indiana down towards in Indianapolis, from Rensselaer to Indianapolis, and all of a sudden you just wind turbines all over, okay? But wind only works in a few places where you have uh, consistent enough wind, so far as that goes. And the problem with solar is it only works when the sun shines. Um, so f as far as that goes, so people are looking at all kinds of storage technologies. Uh, but in fact, um, these are subsidized. They're not really economical yet. Um, if price of oil goes back up, they become very economical. But when oil is down low, they're not as economical. Um, and so they um, essentially allow the utilities, or they force the utilities to um, uh, raise the rates to subsidize the uh, renewable energy, so far as that goes. So that's a, an externality that has driven a whole new industry of wind turbines and photovoltaics. Um, and that helps accelerate the development of these things. I mean, what was the uh, industry that, uh, or what was the, the thing, anybody know what uh, allowed Boeing to develop commercial aircraft? It was the U.S. military, okay? The military would, was developing jets well before anyone thought of uh, commercial jets. But because there was this huge infrastructure uh, of the military, they essentially were able to spin off uh, commercial jets. One of the problems today is the two engine technologies have diverged. What the military needs is a very fast very powerful high-speed engine. What the commercial in, uh, in, industry needs is a very efficient engine. Uh, and so the problem is um, the two are not no longer aligned. However, the industry is large enough that they can afford to develop some of their own engines now for the commercial purposes. And that was one of the big fights between Airbus and, and uh, the United States. When Airbus first started, the United States says, foul, foul. You're giving subsidies to this industry in Europe uh, to build aircraft to compete with our monopoly, namely the Boeing uh, monopoly. And uh, the uh, Europeans somewhat correctly said, ah, but you've been giving uh, all this military aid to your aircraft industry. Okay, so you can have it whichever way you want. Depends on whether you're European or North American. Okay, so another externality, um, and this one is, has to do with intellectual property. It has to do with large turbine blades. These are land-based turbines, um, so far as that goes. But I'll pass around. This one comes from either a 757 or a 747 engine from about 20, 25 years ago, maybe even older. Um, but basically, you can take it apart. It's a single crystal turbine blade. It's been cut by elect wire electrical discharge machining, so you can see the inside structure. And they essentially cool these things with the compressor air from the engine. Um, the cooling air is at about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit because that's the temperature when you squeeze the air in the engine to 30 atmospheres pressure. So you can burn it. Will they bleed off some of that? Yeah. I got a projector because someone left that on all weekend. The lights burned out. Don't fix it now. No, no, I know. Okay, but no, it's not working. Okay, you can turn it on and the light doesn't come on. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in any case, uh, the uh, 
where was I? I was on uh, the engine um, technology. Uh, where was I on the engine technology? Air, yeah. Oh, the compressed air. They cool the, the blades because every 50 degrees Fahrenheit increase in operating temperature of the gas is $2 billion in fuel savings for the commercial airlines per year. Okay, so it's quite an incentive. Uh, but it could cost $20 billion to, to develop a, a new aircraft or a new j engine and stuff. Uh, but there's big savings to be had. And so to go to higher temperatures, they ceramic coat the, the blades. I didn't bring in, I have a ceramic coated one. But they started air cooling them, uh, or compressed air cooling them. And they went from about 2,000 degrees firing temperature of the gas to over 3,000 degrees. That's above the melting temperature of the, of the metal. Okay? If you didn't cool them, they would melt. But fortunately, the cooling air is always there because it comes from the turning of the engine. So the engine doesn't get hot unless it's compressing the air. So it's actually a fairly safe technology. We've been using it for about 40 years. So anyway, here's the cooling passages. They do it on land-based turbines, which is generating electricity. And what happened is General Electric um, had an alloy, GTD-111, and this is the uh, Larson-Miller plot. And you can look at temperatures down here versus stress. And GTD-111 goes to higher temperatures um, for longer, had higher stresses than any other of the um, generally available uh, uh, super alloys that were used. Um, and the original patent expired, okay, in the mid 70s, and it was a very good alloy, so a lot of other people started using it. Turns out that back in around 1980, General Electric applied for a patent on the heat treatment. The patent was denied, and they kept on reapplying, you know, uh, fighting with the patent office. Meanwhile, a lot of other people were designing this alloy into their turbines because the patent had expired and they figured they were safe. Well, it turns out in the mid-1990s, the patent office finally decided to allow the heat treatment patent. And all these other people had billions of dollars worth of equipment that they had out there with GTD 111 alloys, all certified by the, by the agencies that certify the land-based turbines and stuff. And they had a problem because now, guess what? General Electric decided they had a patent on this now and you couldn't use it without buying it from them. So it turns out if you um, refurbish the alloy, if you had already bought one and after it served about 10 years of service, 30,000 hours, it's no longer good for continued service because the microstructure coarsens and it no longer has the good properties. But if you could figure out a way to reprocess it and end up with the same thing, then you could reuse it because you already bought the license when you bought the blade when you, to begin with. And you used it for 30,000 hours, it's no longer any good, but if somehow you could reprocess it, it turns out there is a way to reprocess it. Okay, so by 2000 people, it takes a few years for people to adjust. They found that they could use hot isostatic pressing, uh, which is a technology, if you take the deformation processing or the uh, casting lecture, you'll find out how to heat treat things under uh, 20,000 PSI of pressure, and you can refurbish and get the good microstructure back. Okay, so that's, okay, another one is, Offsets. Anybody familiar with offsets? It's very common in the aircraft industry, the commercial aircraft industry. Boeing or Airbus wants to sell something to Indonesia. And so it's going to be a $7 billion order or something like that for new aircraft, okay, for Indonesian airlines or whatever. Well, as part of the deal, the Indonesians, they've got a couple hundred million people, mouths to feed. They want you to build some of the components to the, those aircraft in their country. So if, you're going to, if we're going to give you a $7 billion order, we want to see $500 million done in Indonesia. It's called offsets. And so they agree. Well, what do you have them build? Well, it depends on what their technology is. It's not too bad if you're selling to Japan. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries builds whole sections for Boeing aircraft. Okay? 
the part of the fuselage, and they ship them over, and Boeing sticks them together. Um, one technology that's fairly critical that Boeing keeps in-house is the wings. It's sort of an important technology. And it turns out the landing gear, okay? If you build a commercial aircraft, you start with the landing gear. You have some projection of what the weight of the aircraft is going to be, and the critical thing is that landing gear has to take the impact of landing. It can't be too heavy uh, or you're losing payload. Uh, so you start designing the, the landing gear and you, they keep the, the landing gear and the wings in-house um, with their proprietary advantage. But other things can go anywhere in the world, okay? Um, certainly the interiors and things like that uh, or the doors or something. Well, this was one that Caroline Joseph, who took this class a couple of years ago, brought back from a summer where she worked at Exxon. I think it was Exxon. Anyway, she was down in Houston with an oil company, and they, somewhere they discovered oil, but it was, I believe, sour oil. What's sour oil? Or sour oil and gas? Sour gas means it has hydrogen sulfide in it, okay? And it's, uh, hydrogen sulfide is toxic. Uh, it numbs the, the, uh, ner the nerves in the nose. It's very pungent itself, but then it puts your, no your nose to sleep and you just die from uh, hydrogen sulfide poisoning. There's actually a, in the corner, southwest corner, southwest, yeah, southwest corner of Wyoming, you go through this rangeland, they'll have signs saying H2S, and they have 14% H2S in the gas in the ground there. And so the cows have to be very careful about what they breathe. Okay, because some of it leaks up through the ground after they drilled all these holes. In any case, they wanted to do some stuff and they thought they were going to have to use clad pipe rather than carbon steel. And her job that summer was to figure out whether they get away with carbon steel. But it turns out the host country, which she didn't tell me what it was, required a percentage of the work in the country, just like Boeing sells aircrafts to Indo Indonesia or Japan or whatever, the host country wants some of that work. Well, in this particular host country, required the employment of local wo workers. Well, that could be Canada, okay? Canada doesn't like American, U.S. people coming across the border and stealing their jobs. Um, in fact, has anyone ever been through customs in Canada and have them give you a hard time about getting in? I mean, I have. Brian has, okay? Uh, what are you doing here? You know, isn't there a Canadian that can do this work? No, no one could do what I do. No one can screw it up like I do. Anyway, um, and they would allow internal, they would like allow managers from outside the country, but only if they had 15 years or more experience. And not everybody with 15 years or more experience wants to go work in Bolivia, okay, or wherever, because they have problems, other externality problems like Maybe their children are in high school and they don't want to go to Bolivia, send them to Bolivia to high schools, okay? Or they don't speak Spanish or whatever. Anyway, the bottom line of this whole thing was she did the technical assessment and she found out they did require clad pipe for those types of conditions. But the management decision, which had nothing to do with anything technically, which is the whole point of these externalities, they canceled the project. It was too expensive with all these requirements that the host country put on it. Okay, That was not a, a law that was passed in the host country for that project, but they lost a multi-billion dollar project and the development of their own resources because they put these restrictions on because they didn't want people stealing jobs. Well, that's fine. You just, how many million jobs or a million years of jobs did you kill with those restrictions? which I'm sure there are good restrictions for other reasons. Another externality is embargoes. From time to time, we impose embargoes on different countries. I talked about the Japanese and the oil and steel embargo, trying to get them to behave in Nanking and China and stuff and not murder all the people. We thought we were doing a good thing. We have embargoes against the North, North Koreans. We just ended some of our embargoes against Iran. Well, back. Uh, when I was in probably elementary school and high school back in the 60s, uh, the, they had a civil war in Zimbabwe, is Rhodesia now? Anyway, 
um, or Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, yeah, Zimbabwe now is what Rhodesia was. And it turns out Rhodesian chrome ore is the best in the world. And this is sort of like the conflict diamonds. Uh, this chrome ore is so good, you can basically just stick it in the furnace. You don't have to do any processing to upgrade it or anything. It's, it's the richest in the world. It's unmistakable uh, in its appearance. This is uh, a stockpile that the U.S. had of chromite ore from Rhodesia. Uh, and um, they put an embargo on it because people, in um, the revolutionaries in Rhodesia were using this to finance their war. And so we put an embargo on it. Well, it's still passed. I mean, if, if you ordered chrome ore, it might have come from some other country but it just passed through that other country. It was certainly Rhodesian chrome ore. No one else had chrome ore that looked like that. And you can't fake a million tons, okay? Why would you want to fake it? Uh, but, well, you want to fake it because they wanted to sell it. So embargoes don't always work. Another externality is transportation. Uh, one of the examples I like to give is copper pipe. Turns out we lost a lot of the manufacturing base in the United States because uh, China uh, and other parts of the country were underselling us on labor. And it wasn't that we were less productive. We are the, the United States is the most productive con uh, uh, country in the world when it comes to manufacturing. But it's the law of comparative advantage. What's the law of comparative advantage? You might. You haven't had economics course. Well, you're getting an economics course. The law of comparative advantage is, let's say another country can grow rice at uh, $2 a bushel. That's probably a little high. But anyway, let's call it a dollar a bushel. They can grow it at $1.50 a bushel. We can grow it at a dollar a bushel. They can't make computers if they wanted to. But if they did, it cost $10,000 for a laptop. We can make laptops for $1,000. So the law of comparative advantage, we're more productive on both rice and computers. But we let them grow rice, and we make computers because our markup is bigger on the computers. So the comparative advantage is, sure, even though we could grow rice cheaper than you, We'll let you have something so you can earn some money to buy our computers. That's the law of compare. Well, it's not exactly the, the so you can buy our computers. Not exactly the same. In the eight in the nineteen eighties, everybody thought Japan was beating our socks in, in manufacturing. I spent my sabbatical in the mid eighties over in Japan because everybody thought, "Wow, those Japanese make to Toyotas. They certainly." are doing a better job than General Motors. Well, it turns out General Motors was more productive, but the law of comparative advantage basically said, we would buy Toyotas if you'll loan us the money so we can have a Star Wars defense initiative so we can bankrupt the Soviet Union and blah, 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 blah. Okay? Uh, and that's what we did. We had higher productivity than the Japanese, but we were buying their automobiles so they could have the, the money, uh, we would buy their, their cars, uh, and they would loan us the money back so we could build missiles. Uh, and anyway, so the, the law of comparative advantage with regard to copper tubing is we never lost the copper tubing business. First of all, copper tubing is relatively easy to make if you start out with a five or six, billion, uh, five or six million dollar investment into an extrusion press. This is glowing red copper going in and they're just going to squirt it out like toothpaste very, very fast. Um, and we had seven plants in the United States uh, making copper pipe. Why? Because the transportation cost of shipping all that air inside the pipe was too great. Okay, we could, even though we didn't have the comparative advantage in terms of labor rates and stuff, we had the advantage on transportation costs. Um, Gordon Forward, who was a graduate of this department, became uh, one of the top, ma he was named one of the top managers in the United States. He was a Canadian who started uh, with a couple of other people, Chaparral Steel, a mini mill in the mid 70s. And this was when people say, oh, the Japanese have much more efficient steel mills than they did, okay? But the market for that steel was the United States. And as he used to point out, it cost $30 a ton 
to ship it to the United States. So as long as he could make the steel for less than $30 worth of labor per ton, they can eat their steel, he used to say. Okay? He was going to make it here if he could beat them on the labor cost. And he did. Okay? Uh, so anyway, this is a transportation. Another transportation one, which I kind of like, uh, goes back 400 years, 500 years, to England. Okay? And... Uh, this is a, a PBS uh, series about metallurgy. It's about 20, video, 20 hours of lectures on metallurgy. Um, and it talks about the first energy crisis in England. And the energy crisis in England in the 1500s was they were running out of trees for energy. Energy was trees. You would burn wood. You would take the wood, you'd pile, to make charcoal. How do you make charcoal? Anybody know how to make charcoal? Burn wood and suffocate. Okay. Yes, exactly. You, you pile up the logs, okay? You cover it with dirt, and you let a little bit of air in, not much, and you light it and ignite it underneath the dirt and suffocate it, exactly as you said. And it burns off all the volatiles, you get all the smoke coming off, and when you're all done, you put the fire out, you stop the air going in, you put the fire out, let it cool down, take the dirt away, and you got charcoal, okay? Charcoal is a very clean fuel, uh, after you've burned away all the other stuff. Uh, but in any case, they were running, running out of fuel in England. And it says uh, here, it says the revolution of, this chapter on the revolution of necessity, and it says, um, the well today is a broad expanse of, of rolling hills. The weld, this is from a Roman map, a Roman occupation of Britain, and this is where London would be. This is the Thames River. This is the Isle of Wight. This is the weld. It was famous for its forests, even in the, the days of the Romans. The White Cliffs of Dover and stuff, I think, are down here. Um, and if you get on, you can Google it and look at the geology of the weld. The weld is a broad expanse of today of gent gently rolling hills and vales, but once the weld was densely forested with mature oaks, beech, and chestnut, by the 16th century, the 1500s, the weld was dotted with blast furnaces and forges for making of iron, so you can make cannon and other things of war, each surrounded by an expanding patch of cleared land. That's why it's rolling hills today with no trees. The HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship, flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar, contained 2,100 tons of oak, okay? Uh, the USS Constitution, if you go over here, anyone know why she's called Old Ironsides? Because she's made with North Carolina white oak. And North Carolina white oak is one of the strongest woods in the world, and that's why the cannonballs would bounce off her sides. Um, well, it turns out, when they have to repair her, it takes the U.S. Navy. She's still a commissioned ship in the U.S. Navy, the oldest one. Um, uh, it takes the U.S. Navy about 20 or 30 years to come up with enough North Carolina white oak to repair it. Okay? It's still a problem. So there were two uses of oak that were in conflict, and that was making ships, and the other was iron making to armor the ships. And then a third industry was added to these pressures, glass making. In 1558, a law was passed forbidding the felling of trees to make coals for the burning of iron, but the weld of Kent and Sussex was exempted. Typical politicians, okay? Even then, you know, the people, the thing that they're trying to regulate, they exempt because it's all the lobbyists, okay? By 1581, the shortage of wood for shipbuilding was so serious that a further act was passed forbidding the felling of trees within 22 miles of the Thames, within four miles of the Great Forest of the Weld, and within three miles of the coastline anywhere, because you had to get these big timbers for the mast to the, to the sea. By 1615, now we're getting into when they settled America, you know, the United States, England was facing an energy crisis. At last, that country is forced to turn to the source of fuel, England, which had been known for centuries, but which few had chosen to use, and that was coal. And that's where the British coal mining started. But in the meantime, 
they had landed over here in North America and they found all kinds of forests. And this is the Saugus Ironworks. You go up here to Saugus, Massachusetts, which is about 40 minutes away. You, they have a National Historical Park. And this is the Saugus Ironworks. Uh, I think it was around 1619 or something. It operated until about 1632. This is the inside. You can take a tour of the Saugus Ironworks. And it's here because you didn't have trees that you could use in England. And down here, anybody been to Jamestown, Virginia? which was also one of the first colonies. And it, in Jamestown, if you go to Jamestown, they have a glass factory. They have the Jamestown Glassworks, and this is the recreation of the glassworks, very similar to what we have in the basement of Building 4. They could have come here rather than going to Jamestown, but it's, uh, so far as that goes. But it was a transportation problem of how to get coal. Okay, so that's it for externalities. Did anyone, uh, anyone come up with an externality? of theirs, I told you to think of externalities. You think of any externality for materials? Well, think about it. If you come up with one uh, from your experience of where you, yes? Um, Cambridge recently banned the plastic bags in grocery stores. Yep. Um, and so like, now everyone uses plastic bags that are way more sturdy because they aren't banned. But it seems to be kind of like worse than the original. Well, in fact, I always ask for paper when I go to the grocery store. One is the plastic bags are cheap and they break. Uh, but the real reason is I have to take my newspapers and other things and I have to wrap them in twine to throw them away for recycling in my town. And if I have a paper grocery bag, I can stick them in there and put those out. Okay? So I'm saving myself the... the the cost and time of twine. Um, but this whole question of bags is an interesting one because there was a study about 20, 25 years ago in Science Magazine of which is more energy effective, plastic bags or paper bags. Um, plastic bags, of course, have the long-term problem of choking birds or fish in the sea. I mean, they never degrade. Um, and uh, Paper bags, they can just landfill, or they can burn, or whatever, and they get the energy content back that way. But harvesting those trees and making the paper, and if you look at the whole life, life cycle cost, it's sort of neck and neck about paper or plastic, okay? And it depends to a certain extent on the cost of oil, okay? But we're going to get to that, okay? But that's a good example. We regulate things because we're concerned about them. Uh, other regulations, um, uh, a number of years ago, um, people in Sweden decided that cadmium was a toxic metal and they wanted to ban it from the environment. So they decided there's about a tenth of a percent cadmium in the silver contacts in every light switch. That 15 or 20 amp light switch that's on the wall, and you turn on the lights for here. It's got a little bit of cad oxide in it because otherwise it would be a seven amp switch. Without a little bit of cadmium oxide, you get arcs um, that, but with a little bit of cadmium oxide, it suppresses the arcing, uh, and you can get 20 amps out of that same silver contact. So you go to the store and you buy this little cheap switch for $2. You ought to buy the one for $10, the better quality one, but nonetheless, you can buy them and have little silver electric contacts. Um, the Swedes decided cadmium's toxic. Well, the amount of cadmium vapor that comes off, okay, whenever you don't get an arc in a cat switch, is so small that I don't think anyone in Sweden was dying. But I mean, someone could calculate some, some death rate from cadmium vapors. And if you got uh, 50 million people in Sweden, I guess one person would die every thousand years. And anyway, that's another story about um, environmental concerns. But within one or two years, they were burning down so many houses, they decided they could use cadmium. They, they reversed themselves. There was another, the Europeans were doing something else. I can't remember, just more recently. But anyway, oh, uh, I remember one time 20 years ago, my old thesis advisor walks into my office, he had a copy of the periodic table, and he had X'd out chlorine, because the Norwegians had decided that chlorine was was a bad actor in the environment and they were going to eliminate chlorine from the environment. 
And how are you going to do that when the oceans are full of 3.5% uh, chlorine? We'll just get rid of the oceans, right? I mean, anyway, um, once Congress passed a law, uh, they were about to pass a law, someone stopped them, but they were going to ban any, uh, any material that would destroy DNA. Okay? One of the most potent materials for destroying DNA is called oxygen. Okay? And so under this law, Congress would have banned oxygen. And you know what? We wouldn't have had to worry about any environmental problems from then on. You know, we'd all be dead. Anyway, um, this is what happens when non-scientists try to dabble in science. Okay, so we're going to talk about cost and availability. We've done externalities, and this is one of Professor Shadaway's uh, Russian jokes that he used to tell me. I like, kind of like Soviet humor. How much is that doll on the shelf? 500 rubles. Come back tomorrow. You know, they don't have it next door, but it's only 300 rubles. Come back when we don't have it. I'll give it to you for 300. Um, but the, uh, another uh, Soviet joke is there's no truth in Pravda and there's no... What's in Izvestia mean? Anyway, Pravda means truth. And one was, one was a magazine, news magazine, and the other was a newspaper in the former Soviet Union. And uh, um, uh, Pravda means truth, and I can't remember what Izvestia means, but there's no truth in Pravda, and there's no whatever Izvestia means in, in Izvestia. Um, we talked about this before, uh, cost and availability. The fact that we prospect for oil until we have a 20-year supply. And this is actually a breakdown, and you'll have this on, the, on Stellar and stuff if you're interested in these types of things. In North America, we have, we're um, well behind, beyond, behind a number of other places in proven reserves, um, namely the Middle East. Uh, their proven reserves are a very large fraction of their potential reserves, and that's because they've drilled for oil in Saudi Arabia back in the 1920s or whatever, and they, they struck it rich. Uh, and it just flows um, with very, very low extraction cost on the order of $5 a barrel or less to pump it out of the ground. South America, and most of it's because of Venezuela, they have unconventional oil reserves underneath the Orinoco River. Um, in North America, a lot of our reserves are up here in the tar sands in Alberta. But anyway, Asia and the Pacific don't have a whole lot of reserves in terms of oil. But we prospect for oil until we find a 20-year supply, and then we decide that we have enough oil, but it's going to run out in 20 years. And we've been saying that for 100 years. Uh, this is a plot of the materials that we use over time. We'll get back to cost in a little bit. But this is, comes from Professor Mike Ashby, who was, I uh, can't remember where he, was, where he was before he went to Harvard, but about 1980, he uh, published a book called Engineering Materials um, in which he had this plot and it's a very nonlinear axis from 10,000 BC up through um, the Christian era uh, and then going up by 500 years, 100 years, 20 years up to and he plot he published this about 1980 okay and in 2011 he pu published it in color and in 2012, he no longer has this plot, okay? There's lots of problems with this plot, aside from the nonlinear axis. But basically, what he was trying to show, that we have four classes of materials for structural materials, metals, polymers, composites, and ceramics, and glasses. In the old days, the metals were gold, copper, tin, and bronze. Polymers were wood, skins, and fibers. Composites were brick for straw, um, or bricks made out of straw and clay and paper, um, composites and glasses, stone, flint, pottery, glass. And then here we have higher tech materials, but still other things. And the thing is, in 1980, for example, in 1970, when I graduated from this department, 75% of the faculty were metallurgists. It was the Department of Metallurgy and Material Science. Okay. It was actually right before I graduated they changed it to the Department of Material Science and Engineering. It started out in 1865 as the Department of Geology. Metallurgy didn't even exist until the 1880s, and that was because of Andrew Carnegie and steel. Um, 
but it was the geology department, and then it became the uh, uh, metallurgy department, and then it became um, around 1970 or so, it added material science to the name. And now it's material science and engineering. But he was predicting, as everyone else was, a decrease in the amount of metals that were used. Now, this was 1980, and I used to listen to this. I gave a talk down at NIST one time in, like, uh, mid-'80s. And this was when everybody had a, said ceramics was going to take over the world. <laughs> and I thought, well, not for structural materials, although we do use, and I'll show you, we use more ceramics for structural materials than anything else, okay? But not for really important structural materials, which is what this class is supposed to be about. It turns out the reason is ceramics have no ductility, okay? They're brittle. And I remember getting up in the big lecture hall at NIST at this conference and saying, uh, I actually was starting a, a talk, and I guess I think you have the paper that came out of that eventually, called The Future of Metals. I was so sick of hearing everybody talk about how ceramics were going to take over the world that I ended up eventually writing this, this paper on the future of metals in the early 1990s, and I sort of became a poster child for the American iron and steel industry. Uh, Iron and Steel Institute. Um, in fact, I was the first person ever to give a talk at U.S. Steel Research Labs that wasn't from U.S. Steel to talk about, because I was talking about steel was an important material and I had to go there to convince them. A couple of years later, I had to go to the AISI annual meeting. Uh, this is all the CEOs of all the steel companies in the United States and give them a talk on why steel was important. And I thought, that was beautiful resort down in Orlando, gated community. I mean, I'd never seen a place like that before. And I thought, so I have to come and tell the CEOs of steel companies why steel is important? There's something wrong with this picture. Anyway, um, but metals are important, and they have not lost um, their importance, and we're going to talk about that in this class, okay? So far as what's available, if we're talking cost and availability, it turns out, you can see, this is um, element abundance per million silicon atoms. And so it's normalized to a million silicon atoms right here. And you can see oxygen is the only thing above that. These are rock-forming elements. Here are the rare earths, and the rare earths aren't really so rare, okay? The rarest metals, the, the gold and platinum and osmium and iridium, I mean, I made my wife's engagement ring out of platinum iridium. Um, these are fairly rare. The, the uh, astrophysicists like to look at iridium because there's more of it in inter interstellar space and they can tell if it came from meteorites and things. Anyway, um, so this is the concentration of what's available. And we have lots of iron, fair amount of titanium, lots of aluminum. Um, and these other things are in lesser amounts. But that's not really the most important part is their availability, it's their cost. But the abundance in the crust is silicon is right behind oxygen. A lot of the minerals are silicates. Aluminum is very, very large amount of aluminum. Iron is um, high. Where are these elements made? I mean, how did nature make these elements? Anybody know? At the time of the Big Bang, everything was hydrogen and helium and maybe a little lithium and stuff. All these were made in supernova explosions, okay? That's where you get the heavy elements. And remember, the, the core of the Earth is iron. Well, that all took a, a few billion years to have enough stars die to have supernova explosions and start creating these heavy elements. Iron is abundant because its nucleus is the most stable nucleus in the whole periodic table, okay? These others tend to be more reactive. Um, and here are these various things. Oh, the last one, I'll pass this around. Um, you can see beryllium is an interesting material. It's fairly abundant, but we don't use it a lot. Anybody know why we don't use it? Uh, no, it's not actually that brittle. It's actually fairly duckel. This, this is a piece of beryllium. It cost me $130. Typically, beryllium will go for $1,000 an ounce or so. It's very toxic, okay? 
In fact, the toxicity, well, it's not toxic to touch. The toxicity is if you breathe in particles, whether they're beryllium oxide, sulfide, metal. And it was all discovered up here on the, I think it was on the corner of Mass Ave and Vassar where the little, I'm not positive, but I think it's near where that Bank of America thing is. During World War II in the Manhattan Project, there were some people at MIT that were machining beryllium for the Manhattan Project. It was a fairly new metal. And some of them got brilliosis. If you get the particles in your lungs by breathing them in, 10% of the people in the world have a, a genetic predisposition to form these nodules on your lungs. There is no cure. You just basically suffocate over time. Okay? And so the first people ever to have this disease were a couple of MIT machinists. Okay? And they supposedly, I think that's where the building was, but they just shut the building down because it was full of powdered brilliant. <laughs> Okay, they, no one knew about this. They had never worked on it before. And so they uh, supposedly, they eventually encased everything in concrete and buried it in the Boston Harbor. Okay, that's the story I've heard. Okay. <laughs> well, that was 60 years ago, and that was okay back then. Okay, environmentally. And actually, if you encase it in concrete, concrete lasts forever in the ocean, nearly. Um, and no one's going to be breathing those particles uh, anytime soon. But in any case, um, so there's the minerals. This particular plot, which is from Jack Westbrook, and Jack was a graduate of this department back in the 50s, went to General Electric in the early 60s. He developed this plot as part of an internal General Electric strategic planning um, exercise. And this is mater structural materials uses versus cost on a very, very log-log scale in terms of what do we got? Three, ten orders of magnitude on this axis. And across here, we got about six or seven. And what we have here, these dashed lines are ISO market size lines. So that, in 1962, that was a billion dollar market. I actually have someone who's supposed to be updating this for today. But the most used material and the cheapest, at, you could get 10 pounds of stone back then for a penny. Okay? Now it costs a little bit more. We'll get to that. Diamond was the most expensive. It is a structural material. We use it as an abrasive. In fact, we use more diamond as an abrasive than we do for jewelry. Okay? But it was $10,000 a pound. It's more expensive than that. But the interesting thing, here's the trend line for lots and lots of structural materials. Yet it's carbon steel and alloy steel and wood and cement and brick, aluminum, um, clay tile, cemented carbides. You got a lot of different materials on here. But the slope of this line is about um, four to one, whereas this other line, the dash line, is one to one. And what does that mean? That means if I could drop the price of a structural material by a factor of two, I would double the market size over the long run. It won't happen overnight, but if I could come up with a way to drop the price by a factor of, of uh, two, I should, with a slope of four, in the long run, end up with double the market. Okay? So there is an advantage to reducing cost of materials, and we'll, we're going to talk about some of that later, how to reduce cost of some of these things. But one of the things that controls cost is the energy density. So this is millijoules per liter versus, or megajoules per liter versus megajoules per kilogram. Turns out liquid hydrogen and hydrogen gas, way up here, this is again, um, well, the, the density varies by uh, a factor of 10 up here. But in any case, here's your lithium ion batteries. They're not really so hot when we talk about energy storage and density and stuff. Uh, but aluminum is way up here, okay? Iron is here, and there's all kinds of other things in between. That's why aluminum is often called canned electricity. It has extremely high energy content. Um, and there's a bunch of aluminum, <clears throat> as far as that goes. It turns out energy is a commodity. Um, this is coal, oil, and natural gas. This is um, metric tons equivalent. The United States has a tremendous amount of coal. What's the biggest coal mining area of the United States? Anybody know geographically? No, no, state. What state has the most? 
West Virginia has the best quality coal in that it's good for making steel and stuff. But most of the coal, when times are good, comes from Wyoming. It turns out Wyoming has got coal mines where you have a, up in northwestern, northeastern Wyoming, you have 100, 100 feet of dirt, and then you get to the coal seam. And then if you, have you been to West, anybody been to West Virginia? I haven't been there for a couple of weeks, but yes. You've been to Wyoming. Yes. Have you seen the, the coal, coal fields up there? Yes. Okay, so tell me what they're like. Um, they're, they look like really big valleys. And yeah. You can kind of like look up and see that it kind of expands for maybe like hundreds of miles. Yeah. And it's just a big scar into the earth. It's really deep. Right. But it's the same like elevation as the plains around. Right. You, there's a huge... Well, it's not exactly... It depends on which side of the valley you're on that they're digging out. Yeah. There are no rivers up there to speak of. So it's good for mining. You can take off the top 100 feet of dirt, and then you have a 200-foot coal seam. Now, in West Virginia, you look on the side of the mountains, and you'll see a 3-foot or 4-foot or 6-foot coal seam. Okay, You'll see it in the sides of the mountains where they've blasted and stuff. But in Wyoming, it's 200-foot deep. Okay, Now, it's, it's sub-bituminous coal. It's not as good as the bituminous and anthracite coal in West Virginia in terms of how old it is and how dense its energy is and stuff. And it has a lot of water content. Uh, but you could, when I was there in the mid-80s, it was, you could get it for $5 a ton. Okay? But you had to, you had to take it out of there by train, and you might be taking 30% of your weight was, was water. So there's a big deal of how to dewater that coal. But nonetheless, we have tremendous coal reserves. China has huge coal reserves. Um, now, because they have no rivers, they can take the 100 feet, feet of dirt off. And you, you're right, they have a big valley there. And they'll, they'll come in the largest dump trucks in the world, largest shovels in the world. And they'll just take that. And the, the mine face may be two miles long. Okay? And they have about 15 of these mines owned by people like Exxon, Mobil, and, and stuff. Big energy companies own these things. They're all closing down now because the energy price is down. Okay? But this was good for generating electricity, steam coal. Um, they have to put the, the land back exactly the same contours, but it's just about 200 feet lower. So it's, you're right, it's, it's, about, it's exactly the same on both sides of the mine. But it's about 200 feet lower because they took the, took the coal out. But they have to return it. Although, actually, the grass is greener on, on the new part. <laughs> OK? Because um, they seeded it and everything. Uh, Russia, being 8 million square miles, has got a lot of coal. China has got a tremendous amount. If you look at the aluminum production in the world in recent years, you'll see China has increased by two and a half times in six years. The world has gone up. The price of aluminum has dropped dramatically. Um, and this is my take on this. China's overproducing aluminum as a means of exporting coal. When the former Soviet Union first uh, uh, started to open up in the, in the uh, early 1990s, they started dumping aluminum on the world market. And it just destroyed the profitability of Alcoa and Alcan and all these other aluminum producers around the world because they dropped their price by about a factor of three. And that's because they were producing their aluminum in Siberia, where they had lots of energy, and they were producing it for kind of their own use. But then when they, when the, they joined the world economy, they basically wanted to get capital, and the only way to get capital, because they didn't have the pipelines to get the oil and gas to market, they would just produce aluminum. And they'd ship the aluminum. It's canned electricity. And the, Chi the Chinese right now are doing the same thing. It's their way of exporting all their coal. Okay? We, it is, again, we're having another shock to the uh, aluminum market. Uh, other producers that are using hydroelectric power and other things are going by the wayside because they just can't afford to compete with the Chinese dumping their aluminum on the world market because that's the way they're going to get their capital. So, Okay, uh, tomorrow Dr. Belmar will be here. I'll be at jury duty unless I get excused.